I would play Star Wars with my siblings in, in the living room. I wanted to be R2-D2 instead of Princess Leia. I was definitely an odd kid. But um, I've really gotten to explore Star Wars through working on the Clone Wars. And um, I am a huge fan. I definitely am a Star Wars nut. And uh, I've discovered that I'm not alone. You know, Close to half of all Star Wars fans are girls, and it's been such an amazing experience to work on her universe and to connect um, with with Star Wars fans and especially female fans all over the world. Yeah, you know, there are movies that look arguably The Godfather is probably I, I probably like The Godfather better than Star Wars, but I feel more passionate about Star Wars, and I just wonder if the action figures, um, uh, you know, you know, part of that are, are in terms of. Why do you feel so strongly about Star Wars? Why it's so, and you know, why we'll get indignant about the prequels, or you know, you'll be so, you know, gung ho, defend, you know, talk about how great. I mean, why we're so involved, and why I think two thousand sixteen or when it's fourteen or whatever. It, when's when's the prequels? The new ones coming up. Fifteen, when it, or supposedly. When, it's too, when that can't come soon enough for us, and you know, why you'd stand on line for. We'll all get on our hoverboards and uh, go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, play, you know, the fact that you were so immersed in the world by playing with the action figures and, and, and you know, the expanded universe, whether it be reading the books and stuff, was that something, you know, that was really important to you growing up? And, um, you know, why do you think that you, f you know, feel the way you do about these films? Is it just because they're great films, or some of them are? Uh, or, you know, is there another reason? Is there a deeper reason? It, it was, for me, it was everything. It was, it was the first time... I, mean, I didn't have any other frame of reference. It was from the beginning of my life, Star Wars was everything. And I, I could take it home and I could play with it. And it wasn't like I wanted it because it was a toy. It was because I wanted it to still be in Star Wars. And that was the closest thing I could get to it. And there's these huge gaps between movies. And when you're back then, that's that's like, it's more than three years. I mean, so much happens in that. Now you, you could fill it, you could learn about it, and they have all this ancillary things. And Star Wars, it was slow out of the gates to kind of you know, put it out there for kids. And once kids started to have it, it was just every every kid in the neighborhood. It was Star Wars. Every kid had their own Han Solo. And it, and it was just this explosion of, I don't even know how to describe it, but my older brothers were really into it. So they would get the toys, and I would just keep them and pocket them. And <laughs> where is my Greedo? And like, I don't know. And, and so then it became, you know, I didn't read like the Han Solo novels when they first came out. I was just too young. Mm -hmm. So I, these are things I discovered later. When, when Star Wars kind of died in the mid '80s, it was the ancillary things and the comics and the, the things you worked on. The we wouldn't have known about the hoochips between Empire and <laughs> Return of the Jedi, but I'm not getting for the comics. Dramas. I mean, that was that was something that was massive for me too, because there were these gaps in, this, in in movies, but you could listen to these things. Mm -hmm. And we did a radio drama this summer down at Star Wars Celebration. I wrote like an original Han Solo thing, like a throwback, because that was to me so magical, like hearing it and realizing that your mind just filled in all the gaps. Once you had those key Ben Burtt sounds and, you know, anything that could bring me closer to Star Wars, I just gobbled up. That's awesome about the radio drama because I, that's another, again, you know, I hadn't really thought about that in a while, but the radio dramas, that was a big deal. I mean, I occasionally, my parents would still listen to like old, like on Mondays in New York, they would put like the shadow on the Lone Ranger, but that was over long ancient history at that point. But Star Wars actually got people to go back and listen to the radio. I mean, like, we would listen to the radio, so that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And um, it was an amazing thing. And those radio drums are great. Fantastic. Oh, they're written, they're well-performed. And what they did was they showed you extra little corners of the galaxy, mm -hmm. ancillary parts of the story, little expanded bits. Like, the scene ended in the movie, but you're like, what? I hear more about this? I found how, how Princess Leia got the plans, the Death Star, and there's all these backstories, and Luke right. and his friends are like, well, what's going on? And it was... That's, I just thought that was incredible. That's what made you realize Star Wars was more than a movie, a series of movies. Mm -hmm. It was a story. It was a legacy. It was a mythology. That it was, was a, a living, big, breathing thing. Expansive. Yeah. That I was like, you could live in this universe. And I wanted Han Solo to come down with Chewbacca. I remember I was like five, and I was like looking out the window. I was like, oh, I just go away with that. <laughs> I was like crazy. <laughs> was that crazy? Was that when you were working on? You know, the comic books, was, was that sort of a feeling you had in terms of expanding the universe and being a part of this expansive universe? I, I, when I had a chance to 
create stories in the Star Wars galaxy, it was, I was an absolute zealot about it. I had, I, I absolutely attacked it as if it was the most important thing that ever could be. I, I didn't want to approach it like, okay, here I am, it wasn't a job at all. It was a religious, like, it, I was a member of a clergy, you know. I had seen Power of Myth at that point. I had read Joseph Campbell. I had uh, studied Kurosawa. I'd seen all the films. I'd, I'd heard about the connection that, and that George had had really delved into that stuff and, and hit these primal notes that no one has really hit since. And we all know it. That's the funny part, right? Mm -hmm. It's like every, you know, who hasn't read Vogler at this point in Hollywood? And yet no one can really hit it the way George and his team did because he had a great, and those British technicians, mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, they, they really, uh, despite a real lack of respect for him, as, as we now know, That's right. That's did right. a great job for him. So I, I jumped in absolutely full bore. Uh, I remember looking up in the sky and, and, and feeling that they were out there. Remember that? Yeah. Like, you feel like there's a chance they could come. And we've all done this. Uh, yeah. right? We've all done it. There's got to be something in my brain. You know, that 90% of our brain that we don't use has got to be in there. You know, for the most part, these are films, uh, both the visual effects and uh, the production design, the look of it, you know, ha have, have it dated the way other genre movies have. You know, why do you think that is? Why do you think that these films, you know, have endured? You know, not because of that nostalgic passion that we have, but more as films themselves. They're just incredibly well-made movies, episode four and five. Creative limitation. Creative limitation. The Death Star was one set. You ask anybody, or ask the guys that were there, and they'll say, you know, the, the Death Star was one set. We reuse things. The, the pillars that, that Luke hangs his grappling hook on were, were in the blockade runner, turned sideways. These are, when you've got, when you've got to work like that, uh, there is a certain, I, I believe, uh, a sense that comes to the artist, and you you get really interesting things. The great films, you can predict. But I think it's more than that because I it is. That's just one thing. But um, also, I mean, classic film is classic film. You never really know, or or people would make classics every time, right? But you can watch the great films, and they don't date like that. You look at Casablanca, you know, and it's sure it's a '40s film, but. You could watch it any day. It's, it's amazing. Star Wars has that. All three Star Wars. It's the I mythic think. storytelling that George, I think, set out very consciously to study, you know, ancient mythology and the storytelling techniques that go back hundreds and thousands of years and crafted the story that touched on these universal themes that connect with people in a very deep, almost like sort of like a race memory or something yeah. that they really touch something deep within us. So they're relevant, their stories are, are vibrant and relevant to any audience. It's, it's amazing how unrepeatable they are though at the same time, right? Like everybody right. knows that he read Joseph Campbell. Everybody knows, right. everybody's read Christopher Vogler now. But, right. but still, there, there's all these other elements that come together but to yeah, make it all work. I would ask Colin Ashley, I mean there is that infamous screening where De Palma and the Hayek's and Lucas's inner circle right. saw the movie before John Williams' score, you know, before Ben Burtt's final effects, and they said, oh, we're sorry, George, you know, we're, you just wasted, you know, $10 million, this thing is a disaster, it's a turkey. Um, was it their inability to judge, or was it that the score and the effects brought so much to that picture that it was impossible to realize that until all those were replaced? Yeah, that score, come on. We can well, it all comes together, and yeah. the, the score is, um, it just breathes another life into to the movie. And that was also, Star Wars was that, was that one film where sound and visuals meshed and they were equals. And I think just on the technical level, it pushed boundaries. Every Star Wars movie, no matter what you even say about the prequels, there's still $122 million independent movies. And every time, he didn't have to shoot it digital, but he did. He had to push boundaries. He tried things. Maybe people can you know, question some of the, the, the elements that were put in it. But on a technical level, the movies are always pushing boundaries. They're always way ahead of their time because they are the benchmarks for the next 10, 20 years. But in terms of story, like you said, it's the mythology. There's something really deep and intrinsic. If you don't accept the, the mythological foundations that George put in there, then you can kind of undo the potency of what happens at the end of Return of the Jedi. So it's, there's a lot. And George looked at these things like he was an anthropologist. That's what's cool. He went back through history and he borrowed things and he taught lessons and morals and that and, and even when he talks about it, sometimes you can talk about World War uh, Vietnam and yeah, how the politics this was of his Vietnam and the politics of the Roman Empire. And so it's all very logical if you really break it down. You understand the way George was thinking, whether or not it connected with you. That's another thing. But the thought process behind it, it's all. 
it all congeals together, and I understand what he was doing, and that's why I'm so impressed by it, even though people find shortcomings with the prequel. But, but you know, it still introduced Star Wars to a new generation. And the reason Star Wars is so popular today is because you have the original generation of Star Wars fans, then you have the prequel generation of Star Wars fans, and now you have the Clone Wars generation of Star Wars fans. And, you know, no matter what anyone wants to say, the prequels are so special to that generation of fans, and that's why everyone gets so passionate, is because the same experience that, you know, you're, you're all talking about here that you had back in 1977, there were kids that had the same experience with episode one, two, and three, and the now kids that haven't even seen the movies have the same experience with Clone Wars. I mean, Clone Wars, to them, is that experience that you know you had back in 1977. Some that's all they know is Clone Wars. Some that's, that's all crazy. they know. It's so crazy. So I think everyone is entitled to their opinion, of course. That's but not under debate at all. It, exactly. It's just the fact that because of this for him, uh, all pushing the boundaries and making the yeah. storytelling, that's why I like we have this know. franchise now that's yeah. going to continue to just transcend generation. My favorite story about George is how when I suggested the double-bladed lightsaber, how the licensing people who were really in charge of what went into the new films. It has nothing to do with anything the points you said. My, my problems with the prequels have to do with the fact that I was there but when they were being made. And, uh, but I don't want to talk about the prequels anymore. <laughs> but I will talk about how George, the licensing people did not want to use the double-bladed lightsaber. They thought it was way too radical. They were like, what is your problem? This is just so weird. This is not Star Wars. And I said, you know what? You're a marketing person. If George Lucas tells me that this double-bladed lightsaber is not Star Wars, then I will never draw it again. But I want, to make, I want to hear what George thinks about it. And so, <laughs> very reluctantly, I was in my 20s, very reluctantly they, they had me do a drawing. Fine, do a drawing, we'll show it to George. And it was not just the double data lightsaber, right? It's lots of other weapons that they didn't like. Um, that were in the, a couple of which got into the prequels. And including Christopher Lee's lightsaber, the curved handle. That was one that I remember. Well. Thank you. And they were like, this is so weird, what are you doing? What, you're, you're such a zealot, you're so passionate about these you know, films. You're so weird, go away. <laughs> we're just here to make these films, we're here to make some money. Um, cash in on this thing. And so George saw them and he said, Yeah, these are great. <laughs> and he said, These are very Star Wars. I think these are really, really cool. They're, you know, so well, it's, like, it's that whole kind of attitude that is prevalent in this town, which is, you know, bef the gatekeepers before you get to. You have to get past them, right? You have to. And another great story, I'm sorry. Kevin Anderson wanted to, um, Kevin Anderson wanted to say that Han Solo was a smuggler and the spice was a drug. And the licensing people were like, we can't have Han Solo be a drug dealer, Kevin. And Kevin was like, wait a minute, I want to hear what George thinks. And George was like, of course spice is a drug. Why, why else would you smuggle it? <laughs> 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 so this is, this is the, 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 the culture at the, at the grand school. You know, sometimes as adults, I think we overthink it or we know too much. And I, you know, I love that Jedi Younglings arc. Because one of the number one questions at any convention or any event I go to from kids is, how did you make your lightsaber? How did it come about? How, why does it look the way it does? And that's what all the kids want to know. And I think, not, not that it's simple, tenant but as the but robot, it's yeah, like teaches yeah. kids about the youngs, about lightsabers, and how to construct them. It's really cool. And I think being able to put yourself, though, back in a, a kid's mind and, and think about what they want to know about Star Wars. That was my favorite part. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Star Wars is something for, for, for kids 8 to 80. Yes. Yeah, because this is not even I hear a lot about the prequels. You know, it's a whole new generation of kids that are coming into it, right. and it's really for kids. You, you don't know, like it yourself. You're like, yeah, and it's not, it, it's not for, you know, it's more for kids. Right. I know, cried at record. And, but, you know, the great thing about Star Wars was your grandparents could go see it, you know, right. you as a kid could see it. This is why the whole nostalgia thing doesn't hold work. But there was, but the also, people, it became cool to hate Star Wars because it went from, be, before the special editions, it was a little. It was still underground. And then the special editions re-popularized it. And then by the time of the prequels, it was Pepsi. It was Taco Bell. It was yeah. everywhere. And it became cool to hate it. And I remember I lived, was living in New York at the time. And I went to film school. So everyone I was at film school at NYU was like, "Star Wars is the stupidest thing in the history of cinema ever. It's so dumb." <laughs> and that's like the, it, they had to intellectualize it in a way. I was like, "Whoa, let's chill out. It's not." That bad. But there, but there are many, many, many bad movies. No, no, but see, yeah, but he's saying I, I that people, he, people, but, but, but the point Kyle's making is that people dismiss Star Wars as all of it. They're writing you know. articles about how it's obvious racial stereotypes and all these things. And actually, they're creating stereotypes by the way they're writing the article and Spike Lee. And it, it became like this thing about how you cow. 
how many different ways can you bash something because it became very George fashionable. at the top of the, the pedestal. I guess it did. It's hard for me to agree with that given the fact that it made a billion dollars. <laughs> it's still so fashionable. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, still I, say George I agree is evil. Kyle. George raped my childhood. George only puts out movies because he wants money. George didn't trick us into buying toys. We wanted the toys. The whole, the whole thing, that whole thing about, I, I agree. Even the last it's like, you know what, if you don't like it, don't watch it. Right. Don't buy yeah, it. Yeah, I've never don't, really, don't trust them. Don't believe it. You raped yourself. Yeah, I've it's never like, gone into childhood. But, yeah, all that I've stuff. I've never gone in with, with the rabid anti prequel people. Right? I mean, I always made the argument well, he's an unfit parent and the child I, should I, be taken I, away I from him. I'm angry at the anti George people. Yeah. You know, the people versus George Lucas, there's that documentary. Just to, right, right. to even put that out there as your, as your thesis of right. exploration. Yeah, that there's right. something wrong. Like I made a movie for that, so I don't know that much. Everybody's entitled to their opinion about the prequel. But, uh, no, no. I look, I, and I totally respected the point that they're making, and I, I think there's very valid points to be made. Um, you know, look, I, but uh, I obviously we feel differently. Um, I, you know, and, and there are a lot of people who feel you know the prequels got better as they went on. By the time you get to see it, they're better. I don't really think no. that that's the case. But um, but you know, look, I think it's great that we can have this debate. I think it's great that people. Uh, you know, but I think the people who are soured on Star Wars as a whole... Yeah, that's, that just because too Because what George created was this incredible universe. And, you know, if there are parts of it you don't like, it doesn't mean you dismiss the entire universe out of hand. You know, maybe there are people out there who think Splinter of the Mind's Eye is genius, you know? And, and they love that. I mean, but the thing is, it's so rich and so... F I mean, that's why for over 30 years, there are all these corners and all these worlds and all these things can be explored. And you don't have to like all of it to be a well, story. Well, that's the reverse. I've talked to kids, and I'm sure you have too, who find the original movies boring. They don't like the original trilogy. Yeah, they the prefer... They well, <laughs> they <laughs> argue, they argue no, yeah, they, yeah. They, they embrace the prequels. They love Anakin Skywalker. They love Jar Jar. They love are, Jar Jar. Yeah, they are caught up in his journey, and they were really upset My when he turned... wanted the Jar Jar dancing bank. It's all he wanted. <laughs> Really? <laughs> you don't want this cool Nebu Starfighter? <laughs> <laughs>